Hi, my name's Kenan Malik. I'm a London-based writer. And it's a great privilege and pleasure to be here in Oslo speaking um, at the Freedom Forum, and especially in this session with all the other speakers here. For a decade and more, for two decades, I suppose, I've been discussing, debating, defending freedom of expression. And one of the things I found, one of the ironies, is that I found almost no one who is opposed to free speech. No one is willing to say, I don't like free speech. What they say instead is, I'm for free speech, but... You can say what you like, but don't offend, but don't provoke, but don't be irresponsible. It's, a, it's an argument, a perspective that's particularly deep-seated in Europe, among liberals, the left, among human rights activists. They don't like censorship, but they're not comfortable with speech that offends or provokes. So they settle for, I'm for free speech, but. The trouble is, it's a perspective that can be really problematic. The freedom to offend is not an add-on to freedom of expression. It lies at its very core. And if we do not defend the right to offend, we not only eviscerate freedom of expression, we also undermine the struggle against bigotry and injustice. When most people think about threats to free speech, what they think about is things like journalists being locked up, government censors, things like violent responses to, to speech, such as the attacks on Charlie Hebdo, or the um, killing of three bloggers in Bangladesh uh, this year for, uh, uh, for, for their uh, atheist beliefs. But it's a more insidious form of censorship, a more insidious kind of threat, which I really want to talk about. A more insidious kind of threat that grows up in a culture that says it's wrong to give offence, the kind of culture that's developed in Europe over the past 20, 30 years. The kind of culture in which people say, people accept, even demand constrictions on speech in the name of respect or tolerance. Censorship in Europe, most European nations is uh, far less overt than in most theocracies or dictatorships, but it's no less troubling, it seems to me. Why? Well, let's look at some of the arguments some of the I'm for free speech but arguments. Perhaps the most common, the one, the one I've come across all the time is, I'm for free speech, but in a plural society, we need to constrain what we say about each other. A plural society is a diversity of views, deeply held, often conflicting. And in such societies, for them to function and to be fair, many argue, we need to police public discourse, both to minimise social antagonisms and to protect the dignity of individuals from different backgrounds. In fact, it's precisely because we live in a plural society that we need the greatest extension of free speech. In a plural society, the giving of offence is both inevitable and often important. It's inevitable because where there are clashes of deeply held views, it's far better to have those clashes in the open and try and resolve them in the open than suppress them in the name of respect or tolerance. And it's important because any form of social change or social progress means offending some deeply held sensibility. You can't say that is all too often the response of those with power to having their power challenged. And if we say that there are certain things that can't be said, what we're saying is that there are certain forms of power 
that can't be challenged. Perhaps, say, there would be censors, but we also need to ensure that minorities are not denigrated, and therefore we need to, to censor speech to ensure that. Now, virtually all human rights activists will be sympathetic with, with the idea that, that we need to ensure that minorities are not denigrated. In my view, it's morally incumbent on those who advocate free speech also to challenge bigotry. One of the reasons for free speech is that it creates the conditions for open, robust debate, the kind of conditions necessary to be able to challenge obnoxious, odious ideas. I'm an advocate of free speech because I want to challenge bigotry. The idea that you censor free speech or you censor speech in order to uh, uh, challenge bigotry raises two questions. First, who decides what's to be censored? And second, who most benefits from such censorship? The idea that a, 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 few, a few years ago, um, shortly after the publication of the, the Danish cartoons, the Mohammed cartoons in Denmark, there was a row in Britain when uh, the then head of the Muslim Council of Britain, Iqbal Sakrani, made some derogatory comments about homosexuality on uh, national radio. Uh, he thought he was expressing what he regarded to be the Islamic view on the matter. Many gay groups were deeply offended. The police launched an investigation into his supposed hate speech. At which point, 22 Muslim leaders wrote a, a letter, published a letter, which uh, demanded, in their words, the right to freely express their views without intimidation. Of course, those same 22 leaders would not extend that same right to newspapers publishing cartoons about Muhammad. Or take Hertz Wilders, the, the populist Dutch politician. In 2009, he was banned from coming to Britain by the British government because of his unpalatable views. And he turned himself into a, a free speech martyr, demanding the right to speak uh, as he chose. But Bilders himself has campaigned to ban the Koran in the Netherlands on, on the grounds that it is offensive and hateful. Most Muslims, all Muslims, would abhor his campaign against the Koran, but many of them think that a satanic verses should be banned. Many Jews would defend the publication of the satanic verses of the Danish cartoons, but think that Holocaust deniers should be locked up. And so it goes on. And in the end, what you end up with is a situation where everyone says, my speech should be free, but yours is too costly. In a plural society, it is inevitable that much of what I say will offend someone or other. That's almost my definition, what it is to live in a plural society. If we limit the right to offend, we limit, effectively, the right to speak. We also limit religious freedom. What believers of one faith think is often offensive to those of other faith or to those of no faith at all. If we want to defend freedom of religion, we have to also defend the right to offend. And who is it that most benefits from censorship? Not the powerless, but those with the power to censor and the need to do so. Don't offend suggests that there are certain ideas so important to certain people that they should be protected from being challenged, ridiculed, or even questioned. The importance of the principle of free speech it's precisely that it's a permanent challenge to the idea that there are certain questions beyond contention. And hence, a permanent challenge to the idea that authority cannot be challenged. People often talk about offend to a community. What they mean more often than not is a debate within that community. Consider, for instance, 
the uh, uh, controversies over insulting Islam or, um, uh, or uh, uh, mocking the prophet. Many liberals feel very uneasy about such insults, such mockery, thinking it, it's a form of uh, punching down an expression of racism, and sometimes it is. But what such criticism forgets, refuses to acknowledge, is that there are hundreds of thousands of people in Muslim communities in the West, in Muslim-majority communities across the world, hundreds of thousands of people, both Muslim and non-Muslim, challenging religiously-based reactionary ideas and institutions. Writers, artists, activists, many of whom you've, who you've heard from, putting their lives on the line every day, fighting blasphemy laws, fighting uh, for equality, defending democratic rights. It's those people we betray if we don't defend the right to give offence. But now comes the next but. I believe in free speech, but with speech comes responsibility. Well, in a sense, that's a truism. You know, there's almost nothing we do that doesn't come with responsibility. But what does it mean to say, speak responsibly? Well, that depends on who defines what responsibility is. To the Russian government, it means don't mock Putin. To the American government, it means don't reveal NSA secrets. To many Muslim groups, it means don't depict the prophet. To many gay groups, it means don't call homosexuality a sin. Speak responsibly, in other words, all too often means speak in a way that doesn't confront certain forms of power or certain kinds of belief. What's really irresponsible, in my view, is to accede to that demand. If we want an open, plural society, if we want to challenge injustice and bigotry, if we want to defend freedom of religion, if we want to challenge power, we have to defend the right to give offence. No ifs, no buts. Thank you.